Mickey's Christmas Carol has become a holiday classic, and it was the first version I covered in the series. This time, I'm covering a different story featuring Mickey and Friends. Although it's not a true Christmas Carol adaptation, it does take several elements from the story, and was clearly inspired by the cartoon in particular. For the most part, I'll admit it, I'm using the shaky connection to talk about an obscure piece of Disney theme park history. In 1985, two years after Mickey's Christmas Carol premiered, Disneyland put on their own Christmas show. The Magic of Christmas was performed on the Videopolis stage, now known as Fantasyland Theater. The park's performers, the Kids of the Kingdom, sang a number of Christmas songs accompanied by Mickey and his friends. Scrooge McDuck continuously groused at them, but ultimately felt the magic of the season. A half-hour show at Disneyland doesn't seem like much to make a video about. There have been hundreds of these kinds of shows all across the Disney parks. What sets this one apart is that it was actually filmed and aired as a TV special. It was titled A Magic Kingdom Yuletide Special, but it appears to be the exact same show, just filmed on a soundstage. I guess they thought The Magic of Christmas was too generic a title. I get that. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. I love these old specials. They're incredibly cheesy, but in a very endearing way. The ones with the costume characters are especially fun. They remind me a lot of the old sing-along tapes, and hold a special, cozy place in my heart. So why not take some time and look through this odd little Yuletide special? According to the credits, the show was conceived by Barnett Ritchie. You might not know her name, but you've most likely seen some of her material. She directed and choreographed countless shows and parades, including the Main Street Electrical Parade, the Golden Horseshoe Review, the Disneyland Fun Sing-Along, and most notably, Fantasmic. In this special, she's also the voice of Minnie Mouse. Someone involved in this production, most likely Ricci, was a fan of the 1970s Scrooge musical. Three songs from the movie are included, and as a fellow fan, it was a pleasant surprise. The show opens in a snowy meadow. The kids of the kingdom, hereby referred to as the kids for convenience sake, are walking with a few Disney friends. They're singing a rewritten version of our first Scrooge song, Father Christmas. This leads into an original song, How Much Longer Till Christmas. How much longer, oh how much longer till Christmas, Christmas? How much longer till Santa comes our way? Scrooge McDuck comes blustering in, complaining about the season. This prompts another round of Father Christmas, closer to the more sarcastic original version. Merry Christmas! Scrooge, along with most of the Disney characters, is voiced by Jack Wagner. Wagner was referred to as the voice of Disneyland, doing many of the park's announcements and safety spiels. He often voiced Mickey and friends in live performances and the Disney on Ice shows. Scrooge complains some more and stomps off, refusing to believe in the magic of Christmas. This is our closest connection to Mickey's Christmas Carol, the loose through line of Scrooge being unpleasant at Christmas time. It should be noted that he is referred to as Mr. Scrooge the whole time, and not Mr. McDuck. Donald's costume is also the exact same outfit he wore as Nephew Fred. Not wanting to let Scrooge ruin their good time, the kids propose a sleigh ride. With a little of Mickey's Christmas magic, which he appears to carry by the fistful, a sleigh is conjured up along with six horses. I can't be the only one who doesn't care for these costumes. This leads to a lengthy medley, including Jingle Bells, Sleigh Ride, Silver Bells, and many other appropriate winter songs. Highlights include Mickey and Minnie skating together, and an appearance by a roly-poly Frosty the Snowman. Scrooge has apparently been lurking nearby, and scoffs again. The kids want to see Santa's workshop next. A little more of Mickey's Christmas magic sends us to the North Pole. The elves are hard at work, along with seven familiar dwarfs. This is accompanied by, of course, Toyland. The wooden soldiers march out next. This is followed by my favorite part, Br'er Bear, Baloo, and Liverlips, all clad in tutus, performing the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Unfortunately, the next song is my least favorite part. A quartet of baby dolls belt out the novelty song, Nothing for Christmas. It's meant to be funny, but it comes off as shrill and obnoxious. At least the actresses look like they're having fun. Luckily, a red-nosed Goofy shows up next as Santa. He's accompanied by the silly reindeer, 
who are much more endearing than those creepy horses. After a few verses of Must Be Santa, Goofy launches into our second Scrooge song, December the 25th. Of all the days of all the year that I'm familiar with, there's only one that's really fun. My birthday! No, that's not it. Scrooge McDuck wanders in at the end, insisting that the best day of the year is not Christmas, but payday. Wait, but Scrooge is the boss. Wouldn't that mean he'd have to pay his employees? That doesn't strike me as his favorite day. Goofy begins handing out presents, including one for Scrooge. Scrooge isn't sure why anyone would give him a present, and reluctantly opens it. The present seems to contain the spirit of Christmas itself. Out pops an enormous Christmas tree, and suddenly Scrooge is completely on board with the holiday. I guess old Ebenezer didn't really need three spirits, he just needed a magical box. He announces that he'll be joining Mickey for Christmas dinner, although I don't recall them ever inviting him in the first place. Oh well, it would be too awkward to tell him not to come, I guess. Everyone dances around the tree, singing the opening song, A Christmas Carol, from Scrooge to end the special. Aside from highlighting a few fun moments, you might be wondering why I bothered with this old special. I described the connection to Dickens as being shaky, but that was being generous. I think what really intrigued me about this TV special is that it happened at all. Like I said, this was adapted from a show running in Disneyland the same year. The Disneyland version has a few bits of alternate dialogue, and they don't stress Mickey's magical Christmas powers as much, but it's essentially the same thing. The thing is, the Disney parks have staged plenty of shows like this over the years, and it's interesting to see one properly filmed and aired on TV. I can only find two other examples of this happening. Believe You Can and You Can was an absolutely insane special I covered a while ago to promote the opening of New Fantasyland. At one point, they recreated several numbers from the Fantasy Folly show. This wasn't the main focus of the special, however, and seemed more like a time filler. The other special was Mickey's Nutcracker, which aired in 1992 and did exactly what the Magic Kingdom Yuletide did. It took a stage show, filmed it with slightly better production values, and aired it on TV. I imagine it was pretty easy. You had the performers in costumes, the sets were simple, and at least part of the music and voices were pre-recorded. Unless I'm missing an important detail, it seems really cost-effective. Now that I think about it, I shouldn't be surprised they did this. I should be surprised they didn't do it more. The same year the Disneyland show premiered, a similar show was put on over at Disney World. Floridians got a sparkling Christmas spectacular, which ran for over 10 years. It was performed in front of the Cinderella Castle, and followed a similar script. This version prominently featured Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Scrooge appears to be staying in the castle, and is constantly annoyed by the singing and dancing outside. The slim plot actually makes a bit more sense here. Scrooge has a reason to be sticking around. In the Disneyland show, it was unclear why he lingered if he hated the festivities so much. Unless, of course, he secretly wanted to join in, but refused to out of a sense of pride. But perhaps that's reading into things too much. Either way, the Disney World show also ended with Scrooge being touched by the spirit of Christmas. Rather than a box of Christmas magic, it was just a simple gift that did it. The gift was nothing more than a piggy bank, but a kind act can go a long way. I'm pretty sure I've seen the bit with the sugar plum fairy bears done elsewhere, possibly in Disneyland Paris show. I wouldn't be surprised if bits and pieces of the show were reused in other things, but I'm not about to watch every Christmas performance from the parks. That's a little too much for me. And just because we've still got some extra time, here's a quick rundown of even more Disney Christmas carols. In 1957, McCall's Magazine published a very abbreviated Christmas carol with illustrations by the Disney Studio. It seemed to be inspired by the 1953 short Ben and Me, and replaced Bob Cratchit with a little mouse named Cedric. Cedric works as a repairman in Scrooge's watch shop, and his smallest children are named Tiny Tick and Tiny Tock. Instead of being visited by three spirits, Scrooge is visited by the ghostly personification of time itself, who shows Scrooge a dismal future where his only legacy is his greed. It ends the same way, of course, with the reformed Scrooge treating everyone with kindness, especially his mouse employee. A Little Golden Book was published in 1960 called Donald Duck and the Christmas Carol. Uncle Scrooge, for the first time, plays the Ebenezer Scrooge role, with Huey, Dewey, and Louie dressing as the ghosts. This one was written by Jane Werner, who apparently authored over a hundred little golden books. Arguably, it's most notable for featuring artwork done by Scrooge McDuck's creator, Carl Barks. A very straightforward version of the story, starring Scrooge McDuck, 
was published in Italy in 1982. This was one year before Mickey's Christmas Carol premiered, and I'm not sure if it was a coincidence or not. Instead of making use of the many Disney characters Mickey did, this version only has a few familiar faces. Donald Duck plays nephew Fred again, Daisy Duck plays his wife, and Gladstone Gander plays one of their friends. Jacob Marley is played by one of Scrooge's rivals, John D. Rockerduck. Otherwise, everyone else is a somewhat generic dogface person. The story was printed in the US for the first time in 2019. The very well done DuckTales reboot had a Christmas episode with a rather tongue-in-cheek reference to the story. Scrooge is apparently friends with the three spirits, who travel through time to visit the world's greatest Christmas parties. Christmas Past in particular is clearly modeled after Jiminy Cricket. One of the best touches of the episode is the end credits. Not only are they drawn in the style of the opening credits for Mickey's Christmas Carol, they're even by the same artist, Mike Peraza. Of course, there's the motion capture movie from 2009. That one warrants its own entry, although I can't say for sure when I'll do it. Finally, there's a slew of TV series that had their own take on the Carol. I covered the 101 Dalmatians episode in my Cruella de Vil video, but there are plenty of others. The Sweet Life on Deck, Jake and the Neverland Pirates, etc, etc, etc. I'm not too interested in covering these unless I really reach the bottom of the barrel. The Magic Kingdom Yuletide special does not have the same staying power as Mickey's Christmas Carol, nor was it meant to. It still has its own charm, however, and it certainly makes for a fun little obscurity, especially for channels like this. Oh, go on, Mr. Scrooge! Open your present! What have you got to lose? Well, all right, if you insist. That was really a bomb? Just a sick world we live in! Sick people! <laughs>